table in nine weeks, which I think in retrospect now was probably too short a time. Um, I think John Burton, was it two weeks ago, did... Uh, about half of the Old Testament in one sermon, which is a massive effort, so well done, John. Um, and uh, yeah, we are coming today to the point of it all. Um, but before I start, let me just pray, because you know, when, when we open the Bible, when we talk about these things, what we don't want to hear is just my thoughts or my ideas. The Holy Spirit is the one who inspired the Word of God, and each of us here this afternoon need to hear the Holy Spirit's voice for us. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you and we say, would you come and would you move and would you speak? I pray you give us hearts that are attentive to what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, The the film um, that swept the Oscars this year was called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Has anyone seen that film? A uh, really good film. It's a 15 for a reason. That's my pastor's caveat. Um, but it's a really good film. And uh, the first part of the film builds tension around the question, is Evelyn the main character? Is she the one? Is she the one or isn't she? So in this film, it's about multiple universes. And all of these multiple universes are under threat from this evil character called Jobu Tupaki, I think is, is the name, and her bagel of doom. You have to watch the film to understand it. But the whole point is that the universe and the multiple universes that they say exist are going to be destroyed unless the one can be found, the one who will be able to defeat this ultimate evil. And the question is, is it Evelyn? It doesn't seem like it is, because she seems like this ordinary, kind of pretty weak woman. You know, she works in a laundrette. She doesn't have a great relationship with her daughter or with her husband. Her life's a bit, you know, a bit falling apart. Is she the one? And in this Bible overview series that we've been doing, the question has been growing. Who is the one who will rescue the world? So we've looked at how God made this world good and actually our sin has, been, has destroyed it, that Satan has destroyed it. This world is broken. We need someone to rescue us. When I say the word enemy, I wonder what comes into your mind. You might think about people that have wronged you or people that you don't really like. Maybe some of us might be thinking about Vladimir Putin in Russia, the enemies of our nation. Some of us might think of people who've got different political views than us. Well, the Bible says that the biggest enemy that each of us faces is the same ancient enemy that humanity has always had, sin and Satan. It was sin, the rebellion of the first people in the Garden of Eden, that introduced death and brokenness into the good world that God made. You know, sin is like a cancer that will destroy each one of us if left untreated. You know, it's that desire to just be self-serving that ultimately cuts us off from relationship with other people and relationship with God. The Bible describes it like this in James chapter 1. It says that after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. All of us, by our nature, because we've been born in this broken world, we have this enemy of sin, and it's destroying us from the inside out. And we have this enemy Satan. It was Satan who lied to those first people about God. God isn't good. You can't trust him. He's withholding good things from you. So you should disobey him. In 1 Peter 5, it talks about Satan like this. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. This afternoon, sin and Satan are your biggest enemies. They are bigger enemies than any other obstacle that you think you might have in your life. They are trying to destroy you, enslave you, and ruin the image of God in you. That, and we've seen that in the, in the story of the Bible so far. It can be easy to think that the story of the Bible, you know, the, first, the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, is like a story of great heroes and characters that we should try to be like and copy. But actually, if you've really read the Old Testament, you know that it's a book all about messed up people who can't rescue themselves, who actually make their situations worse. People who find themselves in slavery, oppressed, mistreated, kings and rulers who mess up again and again and again. In fact, the whole of the Old Testament is meant to be crying out to us, we cannot fix ourselves. Humanity is so broken, we can't do it on our own. We need the one. 
We need the saviour. We need the rescuer to come and sort it all out. And from the very beginning, there was a promise. Even when the man and the woman first rebelled against God, there was the promise of one who would come and crush the head of Satan. We talked about a few weeks back the covenant, the, the, the committed relationship that God promised w- that he would make with his people. There is one coming who will keep that committed relationship from both sides. We've looked at the Exodus about how God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. The one is coming who will ultimately liberate us from slavery to sin. We've looked at the judges and the kings who all messed it up and got it wrong. There is a true judge and a true good king coming who will rescue us. That's the message of the Old Testament. There is a God who will bring justice. We looked at last week the book of Amos and the cry there for justice to be brought into this world. One is coming. That is what the the message of the Old Testament is. And we get to the end of that story and the question is hanging in the air. Who is it? Who is the one? Well, cut to 2,000 years ago, 2,000 miles away, and a baby is born to a teenage mum in an animal barn in a small village. And a bit like Evelyn, the main character in that film, he doesn't seem like much. His childhood goes by without many things of significance happening. But as he enters the peak of adulthood, his early 30s, which is where I am now, so I consider myself to have reached my peak. Um, Happy birthday, by the way, you two. Well over the hill, aren't you, you guys? Um, (laughs) Happy birthday to you. Um, The questions about this guy start to buzz around him. Who is this man? He's reported to be able to perform miracles. His teaching seems to be that of someone way beyond his years and his limited education. And the question is, is he the one? Is Jesus the one who can rescue us from our enemies of sin and Satan. In Everything Everywhere All at Once, the most important question in that film is, is Evelyn the one? Because if she isn't, all hope is lost. Everything is going to be destroyed, sucked into this nihilistic bagel of doom. You have to watch the film to understand it. But it's all, there is no hope if she isn't the one. And that's true for us as well. If Jesus is not the one, there is no hope for us. Because humanity, we haven't fixed ourselves, have we? Look at all the technological advancements that we've seen over the last 100 years, 200 years, thousands of years. Like Humanity is progressing, isn't it? The only thing that isn't progressing is the human heart that stayed exactly as messed up as it was at the very beginning. So the question is, is Jesus the one? You know, there's a reason that so many films have the same storyline where there needs to be a hero to rescue us because that storyline is woven into the heart of the universe because it's true. Just think about a film you've seen in the last like, few weeks or months or next time you're watching a film, think, is this a story about a hero who's going to rescue everyone? And if the answer is yes, it's because God has placed that narrative into the fabric of this universe because all of us deep down know we need a saviour to rescue us. If Jesus is not the one, we are all lost. So what did Jesus say about this? Did he say he was the one? And if so, what evidence did he give? The passage that we're about to read comes from Luke's account of Jesus's life, and it takes place three days after Jesus has died on the cross, and three days after, and and on the same day that he has risen from the dead. And it tells the story of two disciples, and they're walking away from Jerusalem, where Jesus had died, towards their hometown. So we come to it in Luke 24, and I'm going to read it. Now that same day, the day of the resurrection, two of them, the disciples, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, the cross, the betrayal, Judas, all that, all that jazz. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. I think there's an important point in there for us. Jesus is often present when we don't realize that he is, and often teaching us when we don't realize that he's there. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? As if he doesn't know, right? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, 
Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things? He asked. I love that because he he 100% knows what things. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was, notice, past tense. They think he's gone. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped that he was the one. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, which is just a way of saying the whole Old Testament, because Moses wrote the first five books, and then the rest of it can be described as the prophets. Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then we just skip a few verses to verse 44. Back in Jerusalem, Jesus meets these disciples again, along with the rest of the disciples, and he does a Bible study with them. Verse 44, he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. People often ask me how they should read the Bible. They say, where should I start? And often we're tempted to start at the beginning of a book and work our way through to the end, right? And I often say, I don't think there's a right way to read the Bible or a wrong way. But normally what I would say is start with a gospel. Start, and I often say Mark's gospel because it's the shortest one. Gospel is just a biography of Jesus' life because the whole Bible is about Jesus. I think the best way to picture the Bible is that it's like a dartboard and Jesus is the bullseye. Everything else is pointing inwards to him. And if you don't understand that, you can end up giving up on the Bible when you make it to Leviticus, when you read from the start to, to the end because it gets a bit thorny and a bit difficult because of how dense it is. Or people can end up saying things like this. The God of the Old Testament seems really harsh, seems really unloving. But then the God of the New Testament, he seems really great. He's kind of all love and daisies and stuff. And I think when people say things like that, they show that maybe they haven't actually read the whole Bible or they've just glanced at the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because what Jesus says here is every single word on every single page is about him. That's what he says here. He says he explained to them, What was said in all the scriptures concerning himself? Next time you read the Bible, next time you open the Old Testament, have this question in your mind. How does this show me Jesus? Where is Jesus in this text? You know, we have um, some, some kids' Bibles that there might be some on the shelf there called the Jesus Storybook Bible. And it's a great book. You should read it if you're an adult. You don't have to be a kid to read it. But it shows how Jesus is present in every single part of the Old Testament. And the tagline of that book is, every page whispers his name. And it does. So Jesus says to them, uh, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Now, if Jesus is not the one, right? If he is not the one who's going to rescue the world from sin and Satan, this is a massively arrogant thing to say. 39 books of the Old Testament, written over 1,500 years by prophets and kings, they were all writing about me. Imagine me standing up and saying that. You know, some ancient Mayan prophecy is about me. You would think, get this guy shipped off, you know, because he's lost his mind. Jesus is either crazy when he says this, or he's extremely arrogant, Or it's true. Or he really is the one. I've borrowed this from uh, a a commentary um, that I read this week. But in Jesus saying that he is the one, he's saying, I am 
the seed of the woman whose heel was bruised, promised in Genesis 1. I'm the blessing of Abraham to all the nations. I'm the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. I'm the man who wrestled with Jacob. I am the lion of the tribe of Judah. I am the voice from the burning bush. I am the Passover lamb who was sacrificed. I am the prophet who was greater than Moses. I am the captain of the Lord's army to Joshua. I'm the ultimate kinsman redeemer mentioned in Ruth, the son of David, who is a greater king than David. I'm the suffering savior of Psalm 22, the good shepherd of Psalm 23. I am all of the wisdom that's in the Proverbs, and I'm the lover in the Song of Songs. I'm the savior described in the prophets and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. I'm the princely Messiah of Daniel who would establish a kingdom that would never end. He's saying every single part, every single main thing in the Old Testament, it's all about him. But is it? But is it true? This is the most important question for us to ask. A bit like in everything, everywhere, all at once. If she wasn't the one, they were lost. If Jesus is not the one, we are lost. Just consider the following evidence for a moment. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies about the one who would save the world given in the Old Testament. Some of them were about how he would die which he had little control over. Some of them were about how and where he would be born, which he had really no control over. I was, gonna, I was hoping to print out a handout, but my printer broke and the one at church broke as well. So I have ink all over my hands from trying to wrestle two printers this morning. But I wanted to print out these 300 prophecies for you to have a look at, uh, but I'll put them on the WhatsApp groups. But just have a look through. It's absolutely staggering. Um, I, 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 uh, a historian and theologian said this, about the prophecies relating to Jesus. He said, imagine that we take 100 million silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. Huge state, right? Massive. They will cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark just one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly. Blindfold a man and tell him he must pick up one silver dollar. What chance would he have of getting the right one? Just the same chance that the prophets would have of writing eight prophecies and having them come true in any one man. Eight prophecies. 300 prophecies that point to Jesus, that he fulfills. Now, you might be a skeptic and you think, well, how can I know that any of that's historically true? Because that's based on what the New Testament says is true about Jesus. And so how do I know that's true? Great question. Here's a quote from another historian and theologian who says this. The evidence for our New Testament writings is ever so much greater than the evidence for many writings of classical authors, the authenticity of which no one dreams of questioning. And if the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their authenticity would generally be regarded as beyond all doubt. That is what the majority of historians and scholars believe, that the New Testament is a trustworthy document. And when we look at it, we can believe what it says about Jesus. And the big question that you might be having if you would describe yourself as a skeptic is what about the resurrection? You know, we just started that passage where this is on the morning that Jesus rose from the dead and you might be thinking, well, people don't rise from the dead. So what about that? Sir Edward Clark, who was a judge, wrote these words. As a lawyer, I have made a prolonged study of the evidences for the first Easter, the resurrection. To me, the evidence is conclusive, and over and over again in the high court, I have secured the verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. As a lawyer, I accept it unreservedly as the testimony of men to facts that they were able to substantiate. There is so much evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. I have started reading this huge book called The Resurrection of the Son of God by a guy called N.T. Wright, who's this big dog scholar. And it is just absolutely blowing my mind how much evidence there is for the resurrection of Jesus. I never knew the evidence was so good and so strong. Is Jesus the one? Yes, he is. It's all true. The one that the Old Testament said was coming came. And some of us have listened to all of that and we've said a hearty amen. We believe this stuff. We believe Jesus is the one. But my question to every one of us in this room today and especially to myself is, am I living in a way that is consistent with that reality? If Jesus really is who he says he is, if he really has defeated 
my greatest enemies, your greatest enemies of sin and of death, does my life look like it or not? You know, in the film uh, Don't Look Up, another great film that I think did well at the Oscars last year or two years ago, um, it's a really funny film, I'd highly recommend it. But there's an asteroid that's coming to destroy Earth, and there's overwhelming scientific evidence that this asteroid is, going to, uh, is on a crash collision with Earth and it's going to kill everyone. Um, and people don't want to accept that truth. And so they simply deny it. They say it's, it's, it's not real. And then even when they can physically see this asteroid heading towards Earth in the sky, people start a campaign, don't look up. Just if you don't look at it, it's not real, you know? Just ignore the evidence and just get on with your life as if nothing's happening and it's all going to be fine. And it's madness. And it's a funny film because of how ridiculous it is to have so much evidence about something but to not live consistently with it. And yet, many of us who would say that we're Christians can be like that. There is so much evidence for who Jesus is and what he's done, and yet half the time I'm not looking up. I'm looking down and I'm living my life just like everyone else around me. It's not being consistent with what is clearly true. Many of us who are Christians look a bit more like these two disciples walking away from Jerusalem than we'd like to think. Just consider for a moment what these two disciples already knew, right? Before they knew, know that Jesus is there, but they tell us that they know, that his, they know his name, they know where Jesus is from, they know that Jesus was a prophet, they know that he was mighty in word and deed, they know that he was crucified, they know that he'd promised to redeem Israel, he'd said that he was the one, and they knew that other people had said he'd raised from the dead. And I think there's a great lesson in here, always trust the women, right? They, they, they didn't, these two disciples, they were like, well the women said that he's raised from the dead, but who can, you know, not going to listen to them. And they were right. We read in verse 13, the same, that same day, the two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles away from Jerusalem. They weren't living consistently with the evidence that they'd been presented. This eyewitness evidence from these women who'd been at the tomb, saw that it was empty, saw an angel say, he isn't here, he's alive. And yet they were walking in a way that was inconsistent with that evidence. And look at their emotions. They're miserable. They're walking away, their heads bowed in disappointment, headed back to their normal lives. They stood still, their faces downcast. Why? Because they didn't trust the evidence. I read this really challenging quote this week, that Jesus wanted to know from them what he wants to know from us today. Can we believe without seeing with our own eyes? We can believe and must believe based on the reliable eyewitness testimony of other people. That's what the New Testament is. We can believe because there is so much evidence that it's true. But because these guys didn't believe the evidence, they're walking away and they'd lost hope. They'd lost joy. They've got this sense of spiritual desertion. And they hadn't seen the necessity of the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, they thought, that's it. That's game over. We thought he was going to be someone, but they killed him. And when Jesus gets to talk to them about this, he says, you just didn't get it. You don't understand the cross. He says to them in verse 26, did not the Messiah, the chosen one, have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Jesus had to suffer on the cross because only by the perfect son of God, God himself in human flesh, coming and dying in our place, could our enemies of sin and death be dealt with forever. We, no human being can defeat sin. That's the story of the Old Testament. Only God can come. Only God can take the punishment for sin, the infinite punishment of our sin. Only God is able to bear that. Any one of us wouldn't be able to carry our own sin, let alone the sins of the world. But God himself came so that our sin could be laid on his shoulders, so that it could be punished in his body, so that we can be free. And only God could suffer judgment and death and come out the other side in resurrection life. Only God could defeat death itself. Jesus is saying to them, you didn't get it. I had to come and die on the cross so that 
Sin could be defeated and Satan's lies could be proved untrue. Do you know the cross, the biggest message of the cross is God loves you. God loves you. And the big lie that we often get told by Satan is God doesn't really love you and you can't trust him and he doesn't care about you. Whenever you've heard that lie in your own mind, the place to look is the cross of Jesus. God himself suffered all of that hung on a cross in shame and in disgrace. Why? Because he loves you. Because he wants you to be free. Because he wants you to be washed clean. Because he wants you to have a relationship with him. Jesus had to die to show us his great love and to rescue us. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus here this afternoon, don't be like the don't look up crowd. The evidence is overwhelming. And looking down and thinking, I'm just not dealing with that because of the implications it has on my life, isn't intellectually honest. You know, belief should be based on evidence. Some people talk about um, faith being a blind leap in the dark, but I don't think that's true. I think our faith is based on a person, a real person, Jesus. And therefore, we can explore the evidence. We can look at the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. We can read up on the reliability of the Gospels. We can test the evidence for the resurrection. But if we don't do anything about it, it's pointless. If we know that it's true, but then we just don't change how we're living, we're not living consistently with what we know to be true. If Jesus really is the one, then the only option that we have is to bow the knee to him and to surrender our lives to him. And to say, you are the Lord of the world. And I'm a tiny little creature that you made. And so I give my life to you. And you can have it all. And I'll live for you alone. Because only you are worthy of all of my life. That is what we have to do if we're to live consistently with the evidence about who Jesus is. And for those of us who are Christians this afternoon, the question that's been on my mind for weeks and months probably is, why don't I live more like this is true, right? This is true. And I have to remind myself, I have to look up every single day and I have to remind myself, this is true. And therefore, how I live should be different. And the question for me and the question for you is, does your life look like Jesus is the one? Or does your life look like Something else is your saviour. Does your life look different to the people around you who don't know Jesus? I find it interesting in this story of these men, these disciples walking away from, from Jerusalem, the things that are inconsistent in their lives. Their emotions are inconsistent. What has just happened on Easter Sunday morning is the best news in the entire world. That God has defeated sin and death. That we can be free. That death is not the end. Easter Sunday is the greatest news that has ever been. You know, we celebrate Christmas. That's great. We should celebrate Easter more, right? So in two weeks' time, we get to celebrate that death is defeated and Jesus is alive. And yet these disciples, what's their emotions on Easter Sunday morning? Sadness. They're downcast. And I don't mean that as Christians we should walk around with a fake smile plastered on our face, that we should be like, I'm a Christian, so I'm joyful all the time, and everything's wonderful, and you know, there's always a rainbow around me, and all that kind of stuff. But if this is true, if Jesus is who he says he is, every single day we have so much to rejoice in. And I love the, um, the way that the kind of tension of suffering and of joy come together in the life of the Apostle Paul. Um, he uses this line, which I think is great. You can meditate and chew on this line. He talks about being sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Why sorrowful? Because this world is broken. Because we go through griefs in our lives. Because we lose people that we love because life is difficult, because we're in a broken world, because we have enemies, because we have the enemy of sin that's still at work in us, trying to, trying to pull us back from God. We have Satan, who doesn't want us to, to live as people made in God's image and flourish. We have these enemies, and so we are sorrowful. But, Paul says, always rejoicing. It's possible to do both. It is possible to do both. How are your emotions this afternoon? If there's just sorrowful... Reflect on the good news of Easter. 
reflect on the resurrection of Jesus, reflect on the fact that he is who he says he is, and therefore, whatever it is that is making you sorrowful will one day end, will one day be defeated by him, and right now, here and now, you are loved more than you could possibly get your head around by the God of the universe who has good plans and purposes in your suffering, just like he did in the suffering of Jesus. These disciples, they're walking away because the idea that the Messiah would die on a cross was repulsive to them. We can often think the idea that I would suffer in my life as a Christian, oh, I don't like that. I don't want that. But what did, Jesus, what did God accomplish through the death of Jesus on a cross? The salvation of the world. What might he be accomplishing through your sorrow and your grief this afternoon? Are your emotions consistent? What about your actions? You know, these disciples, they're voting with their feet. They're walking away from Jerusalem because whatever they might have said they believed beforehand, now they're showing what they really believe and they're walking back to their homes. What do your actions say about your beliefs? If someone was to follow you around for a week, would they look at how you spend your time and your money and say, that person believes that Jesus is the Messiah who's returning to make all things new and that they should live their lives completely for him because he's the Lord of the world? <laughs> they might not quite get it like that, but they might say, that person seems a bit odd. But they seem like Jesus is the, the thing. Jesus is their everything. Or would they say, hey, they just seem like every, you know, lots of other things are their thing. What about your hope? These disciples, they say, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, but no more. They don't hope that anymore. They're walking away. They've given away to despair, and they're walking back to their old life. What are you putting your hope in? If it's the things of this world, they're going to disappoint. But only Jesus will never, ever disappoint us. What are you placing your hope in, and is it consistent with the truth that Jesus is the one and lastly, what about your purpose in life? Is it consistent? I wonder what you'd say your purpose in life is. Just check out what Jesus thinks the implications of him being the one are for his followers. Verse 45. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them this is what's written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And here's the implications. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Preached by who? His followers, his people. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father had promised and stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Guys, if we're Christians, these are our marching orders. This should be the purpose of our life. Preach the repentance, of, repentance for the forgiveness of sins to all nations. Be a witness of the reality that Jesus is the one who can save the world and seek the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus was talking about in verse 49. If Jesus is who he says he is, then there is nothing else that should consume our lives. There is nothing else worth living for. Why? Because nothing else is consistent with the truth that Jesus is the one. Living this out telling other people about Jesus, living for him, seeking a relationship with him through the Holy Spirit, these are the only things that will matter in a thousand years, in a million years. This is how to live a meaningful life in this life and in the age to come because it's consistent with what is real. And when we live for other stuff, we live a lie and we participate in the delusion that Jesus is not the Lord of the world but he is. As we come to a close, I just want us to take a moment to pause and to let the Holy Spirit speak to each of us where we're at. And we're just going to ask him, where is it in our lives that our belief does not line up with our actions? And I just want you to ask that question to the Holy Spirit. And the answer that comes back for you might be, well, I'm not even a follower of Jesus yet. And if all this evidence is true, there's something I need to do about that. But it might be that he speaks to you about all sorts of things in your life. So let's just invite him to come and to speak to us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here. And we pray that you would show us now where our lives aren't lining up with what we say that we believe. Lord, what areas of our life are we living in an inconsistent way with the truth that Jesus is the one?
Holy Spirit, would you show us how the truth that Jesus is the one transforms the way that we live? Jesus, I know that I wouldn't worry or feel stressed half as much as I do if I was confident that you are the one who's holding the reins of this world. And I repent of that, Jesus, and I say sorry for taking my eye off the truth that you are the one who's in control of all things. Jesus, I'm sorry for when I make my identity in the temporary things of this world. When you've told me who I am, that I'm yours and that I'm loved. And Jesus, you are the one, and so your word, your word speaks a better word over me than anything this world could say. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Jesus is who he says he is. So we are who he says we are, right? We're lost without him, but we can be saved. We're loved, and he sends us out as his ambassadors into this world. Thanks, Lou. Sweaty hand. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. We're going to take communion together now. Um, I'm just going to read the next little chunk from Colossians 1. As we take communion, we um, use grape juice here. Um, Jesus talked about wine being representative of his blood that was shed at the cross and then bread representative of his body that was broken for us. And the next little bit of Colossians 1 says, um, Jesus made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of his blood on the cross. This includes you, who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled, that means he has brought you back into relationship. Um, He has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without fault. If you are here today and you are a follower of Jesus, we would love you to uh, come and take communion with us here. And as you do so, to remember that because of Jesus's blood poured out on the cross, you are holy and blameless as you stand before him. Not because of anything that you've done, but you are without fault because you have been made clean by Jesus's blood. Um, So just as the band lead us in worship in your own time as you're ready, please come. Um, The way we do it here is we grab a bit of the, the bread and we dip it into the juice um, and then take it in your own time but please come and remember the ultimate sacrifice that Christ made for us